Hello and welcome back. This is part 6 to our continuing series about how Calvinism is not Gnosticism. In part 5 we discussed how the system of authority worked among the Gnostics and how it differs greatly with that of the Calvinists. So in part 6 we're going to be discussing the method of salvation. First off, what was salvation according to the Gnostic view? Now as stated earlier about their view, Christ, a created being, sent by the ultimate good and transcendent deity to free the world from the evil materialistic God of the Jews who created the evil material world, Christ inhabited the man, Jesus, at his baptism and gave the secret gnosis of salvation. This knowledge put people in contact with the unseen spiritual world which would help redeem them from the evil world and their evil bodies permanently. There was no resurrection of the body for these guys at all. It was the goal to shed the evil body and free the good soul from its prison. In short, they claimed that all one needed was a great teacher and not a perfect savior who redeemed both body and soul from the effects of the first sin. Page 55. In a closely related concept, it is very important to remember that their version of salvation made the recipient no better. In fact, the Gnostics were not at all interested in proving the character of its members. Page 82. So, what about salvation? How is it according to the Calvinists? Well, we'll go back again to the London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689, Article 1, again under the Holy Scriptures. And we can discover that we as Calvinists believe and affirm knowledge of salvation only through the scriptures and not outside of them through secret knowledge of the heavenly powers or some combination of this knowledge and the scriptures. Section 6. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life is e either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture to which nothing is to be added at any time, either by due revelation of the Spirit or by the traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. This is a fact most Christians still attest to this very day. Even the historical Arminian believes in the necessity of the work of the Spirit for one to be saved, it's not as though fallen man is left solely to himself or requires extra information to be saved. The scriptures alone under the working of the Spirit is what brings salvation to man. Section 7, stated more emphatically in this part, All things in scripture are not equally plain to themselves, nor equally clear to everyone. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and revealed in some place of scripture or other that not only the educated but also the uneducated may attain a sufficient understanding of them by the due use of ordinary means. Again, how can one even begin to compare Calvinists to Gnostics? Salvation comes solely through the word of God and one does not need the Gnostic special edition of extra knowledge to obtain it. Again, dropping down to the Article 11 in the London Baptist Confession under the issue of justification. Most importantly, salvation as confessed by we Calvinists consists firstly of justification, which is the forgiveness of sins and the imputation of the righteousness of Christ in order that we may have salvation as required by the standard of God's law. Further, we assert the sole means of salvation comes through the instrument of faith, which makes us justified in God's sight. A concept, by the way, which was wholly foreign to the Gnostics and emphasized repeatedly in the New Testament. This is not a special insight of the supernatural that will release our good souls from our evil bodies as the Gnostics claimed. Section 1. Those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting them as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone. They are not justified because God reckons as their righteousness, either their faith, their believing, or any other act of evangelical obedience. They are justified wholly and solely because God imputes to them Christ's righteousness. 
He imputes to them Christ's active obedience to the whole law and his passive obedience in death. They receive Christ's righteousness by faith and rest on him, not on the supernatural eons. They do not possess or produce this faith themselves. It is the gift of God. Section 2. Faith which receives Christ's righteousness and depends on him is the sole instrument of justification. Yet, in complete opposition to the Gnostics, who could care less how one behaved in this life, or improving their followers' characters, this faith is not alone in the person justified, but it is always accompanied by all the other saving graces or qualities. And it is not a dead faith, but works by love, and is therefore full of loving gratitude to God, is humbly devoted to Him, and loves to make Him known. Skipping on down, Article 13, concerning the issue of sanctification. Yes, we confess what the Bible says concerning about our flesh nature, that is corrupt, and that it happened at the fall, as was discussed earlier. But we emphasize here vehemently that salvation works a real change in a person. Section 1. Those who are united to Christ, effectually called and regenerating, had a, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, are then further sanctified in a very real and personal way. Because of the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, and by his word and spirit dwelling in them, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed. That is, the era of sin's total control over them is ended. The different lusts of the body of sin are increasingly weakened and mortified, that is, put to death or put away. And Christ's people are increasingly quickened, made alive or lively, and strengthened in all saving graces to practice all truly holiness, true holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The God of the Bible and the Calvinists, the one that the the God that the Calvinists continually preach, is concerned about his disciples' character, wants to change it and conform them to the image of his Son. And he actually has the power to do that, and will accomplish it for his own glory. This sanctification extends throughout the whole person, yet it remains imperfect in this life. Some remnants of corruption live on in every part, and from this arises a continuous war between irreconcilable parties. The flesh lusting against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now I know people immediately will recognize language here that was shared by the Gnostics and immediately rail us by saying we really are their successors. But my friends, this is nothing more than the same things professed from Scripture, and we will discuss those things further at the end of this series. Now in this war, although the remaining corruption for a time I greatly prevail, Yet, through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerating part overcomes. And so the saints grow in peace, perfecting holiness, in the fear of God, pressing after a heavenly life, in evangelical obedience to all the commands which Christ is head and king in his word has prescribed them. My friends, Calvinism is not Gnosticism. Continuing on, Article 31, discussing man's state after death and resurrection, where Calvinists continually affirm that God's salvation just doesn't regenerate the spirits of all souls, justify men all through faith, and sanctify their character all the time. They do everything. God's salvation will include retaining our bodies in a purified state throughout all eternity, which in no way agrees with the Gnostics, who said our bodies were the problem, and once they were gone, we would be free. Section 1. The bodies of men after death re return to dust and undergo corruption. But their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal substance, immediately return to God who gave them. The souls of the righteous are then made perfect in holiness, are received into paradise, which they are with Christ, and look upon the face of God in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies. The souls of the wicked are cast into hell, where they remain in torment and under darkness, reserved to the judgment of the great day. The scripture acknowledges no other place than these for souls separated from their bodies. At the last days, those of the saints who are still alive will not sleep what will be changed, and all the dead will be raised up with their own sane bodies and none other, although with different qualities, and these bodies will be united again to their souls forever. The bodies of the unjust will by his spirit be raised to dishonor. The bodies of the just by his spirit 
be raised to honor and made conformable to his glorious body. Now what Gnostic would ever confess such things as these, that our mortal bodies will be reunited with our souls at the resurrection. Did they not teach and believe that the evil body was responsible for all our troubles and will be shed forever in death? My friends, Calvinism is not Gnosticism. Stay tuned again for the next part where we'll be discussing about two particular Gnostic sects and how they compare with Calvinism, the Marcionites and the Manichaeans. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. God bless.